our college. We are pleased to offer an engaging and, ex and exciting year of now and then program to explore times gone by and spark conversations <coughs> excuse me, on how we have progressed as a college, a community, and a country in the last 50 years. Each of our events this year is designed to look at innovations in technology, social interactions, scientific breakthroughs, and our trends in popular culture. Today we start the celebration featuring a discussion uh, on innovations in video graphics technologies utilized in athlet athletics, astronomy, and robotics utilized by NASA for <coughs> interplanetary exploration. At this point, we have two speakers. Uh, our speakers are Tim Thompson. Thank you for being here, Tim. He has received, he received his bachelor's and master's degree in physics from Cal State Los Angeles, joined JPL in, in the 1980s, early 1980s, and became a member of the radio astronomy group at JPL, currently retired uh, a couple of few years ago. He spent over 27 years doing astronomy and astrophysics at JPL. He has received NASA Group Achievement Awards and, NASA, and various NASA JPL Center Awards. His research experience includes planetary radio astronomy, uh, atmospheric physics and chemistry, infrared geological remote sensing, and infrared astronomy. He's also an amateur astronomer and has done lots of work uh, for uh, public outreach. And he's also part of the Board of Trustees in Mount Wilson uh, Institute, for the Mount Wilson Observatory Institute. And so, at, let's see, sorry. Uh, we also have uh, another speaker who is also a retiree from JPL as of a couple years ago. His name is Wayne Zimmerman. Thank you, Wayne, for joining us today. Wayne received his bachelor's degree in fluids from Case Institute of Technology in Cleveland, Ohio, his master's degree in aerospace systems engineering from USC. Wayne is currently, again, semi-retired from JPL, 38 years of service, and he ha he's a member of a small group of individuals at JPL who developed the robotic systems that grew into the Mars robotic arms and rovers, uh, making amazing scientific discoveries today. He has been a member of several flight projects, starting with the Mars 1998 mission to the South Polar Cap of Mars, the Phoenix Lander to the North Polar Cap of Mars, and most recently, the Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity Rover. He has been a recipient of, again, numerous NASA Achievement Awards. We are very honored to have you here today. Thank you. Tim? I think I already have a microphone. Thank you. Have a seat. Well, there's my topic, uh, astronomy with invisible light, freedom from the tyranny of the eye. See, astronomers have been doing astronomy with this thing for thousands of years. There's a chart that shows you the uh, light output from the sun as a rainbow, the solar emission spectrum. And this is the sensitivity of your eyeball. And as you can see, your eye is really sensitive to blue, and it goes pretty well out to the red. This is the range of wavelengths, say 400 to 700 nanometers, over which your eye is sensitive. And if you do astronomy with your eye, that's all you get to see. Now, we would like to know a little bit more than that. So one of the technological advances that allows us to do astronomy with invisible light is going into space. This chart shows you the opacity of the Earth's atmosphere so that 100% means it's opaque, it's a brick wall. So our eyes are sensitive to visible light and thankfully the atmosphere is pretty transparent in visible light, which is why you can see for miles away because if it wasn't transparent, couldn't see anything at all, light wouldn't get to you. But all the high energy stuff, X-rays, gamma rays, a large chunk of infrared, the atmosphere is a brick wall and you can't see anything at all. And of course, there's a big radio hole, which is really good too, makes radio transmission and radio astronomy possible, which means I would not have been able to get a job when I started at JPL if the atmosphere had not been transparent at those wavelengths. So we go back to the dawn of the 19th century, beginning in 1801, Sir Frederick William Herschel was doing experiments with a thermometer. He wanted to measure, uh, see if there was a difference in temperature between the different colors. And you can see on this, uh, picture, 
he is, uh, he has his thermometer up here on the other end of the red. Well, he discovered as he slid his thermometer along through the colors that when he got off to the red end and kept going, the temperature didn't go down like it was supposed to, back to room temperature. It stayed up. And only after he moved it a little bit further did it then go down. He just said, well, there's something going on beyond the red end of the spectrum, which he called infrared. So right away, of course, Johann William Ritter decided after hearing about Herschel's work, well, if it gets warm off the red end, it must get cold off the purple end. So he looked on the purple end for low temperature and couldn't find anything. Well, of course, Herschel had already done that. He'd seen temperature at one end. He looked at the other end. But Ritter discovered that if you uh, have silver, uh, what is it, silver iodide, I guess, on the purple end, it would turn black a lot faster than it normally would. He was exposing film, basically. So he discovered ultraviolet. So infrared and ultraviolet were discovered right away. So the first person to do real infrared astronomy was the fourth Earl of Parsons. His father is famous for building what was at the time the largest telescope in the world, and very few people pay attention to his kid. But his kid was the first one to do real infrared astronomy. He hung what's called a thermopile out here at the prime focus of the three-foot telescope that his father had built. Thermopile is one of these oh, ancient solid-state devices from the 19th century that is sensitive to temperature, so when it gets warmed up, it creates a voltage. You measure the voltage. You can tell what the temperature is, so he can tell how strong the infrared is by looking at the voltage that comes off of his instrument. And he gave his talk on the temperature of the moon in 1873. And a number of people diddled with infrared during the late 1800s trying to measure the temperatures of stars. They had figured it out, thanks to Ampere and Fizeau and Foucault, that infrared was electromagnetic radiation like light. It would reflect and reflect light refract like light does. So by the late 1800s, 1899, George Ellery Hale, who was the founder of Mount Wilson Observatory, he was a founder also of Yerkes Observatory, and working with a guy named Nichols, they tried to measure the temperatures of stars. They decided their data was kind of noisy, and they didn't really want to come out and say, yes, we've seen star uh, heat from the stars. But modern analysis of their data shows that they probably did. And in the early 1920s at Mount Wilson Observatory, Nicholson and Pettit, using a thermocouple, which is a more advanced version of the thermopile, much more accurate, much more precise, gives you better voltage readings, they placed a thermocouple at the focus of the 100-inch telescope and measured the temperatures of numerous stars and planets. And they were the first people to set out on a significant astronomical program in the infrared, starting around 1920. They looked at Venus, and they were the ones who discovered that Venus is not nice and cool under the clouds. It's hot, and that the day and night sides are equally hot. And they also studied the thermal inertia of the surface of the moon and realized that the moon could not have a lot of dust on it. So if the people running the Apollo project had read the 1920s Astrophysical Journal, they could have dispensed with the survey program altogether. They would have known that the moon did not have a thick layer of dust on it, but they didn't, so of course, a lot of people got jobs out of that. So what am I complaining about? <laughs> <laughs> now, this is modern infrared technology. We don't use thermocouples and thermopiles to detect it anymore. We have CCD detectors, like in your digital cameras. Most of them are pretty sensitive to the infrared. In fact, if you have any normal digital camera, it's got a filter on it to block the infrared so that it doesn't mess up your pictures. People who want to do astrophotography in the infrared have custom-made cameras that take that filter off so then they can expose directly infrared. This is the Spitzer Space Telescope that I worked on for a long time. This is his famous two-tone paint job. This side over here faces the sun and is highly reflective, so the sunlight bounces out. You want it to cool off as much as possible on its own, so this side that faces away from the sun is black because it will radiate more efficiently, get rid of its onboard heat. Passive cooling means you have less uh, liquid helium that you need to carry. And here's the primary mirror made out of beryllium, and I don't remember what the coating is, uh, made out of beryllium for its thermal characteristics. It works just like a regular telescope. It has a parabolic mirror, comes to a focus. <coughs> 
So this is infrared space technology. This is the Spitzer Space Telescope. Now, we step back a bit. Radio from space was discovered by this guy, Carl Jansky, who in the 1930s was working for Bell Laboratories studying noise sources for long-range communication. And he ran into a source that he couldn't explain, couldn't describe, but he discovered that it moved with the sidereal rate, which means that it doesn't stick to the 24-hour solar day, but the slightly different day of the Earth spinning with respect to the stars. So he knew that it had to be not the Earth and not the Sun. It had to be something from the stars, something very distant. But his antenna, which looks kind of like a butter cube here, this great big thing, has pretty good sensitivity in azimuth and practically none in elevation. So he could pin down yeah, the source of his noise to some point like this on the horizon, but it could be there, 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 there. He had no way of knowing how high it was, but most likely somewhere in the direction of the center of the galaxy. He tried to interest professional astronomers in his discovery, and they were all like, ah, you're an engineer, what do you know? And, you know, radio from the guy, ridiculous. Yeah. So they just ignored him. <laughs> but one of the people in his audience was another radio engineer named Grote Reber. And Reber took Jansky seriously, and he built this in his backyard, much to his wife's consternation, I'm <laughs> sure. It's a 30-foot diameter parabolic radio receiver. Lo looks like a big version of the satellite dishes that you use now. This way, he could actually point someplace in the sky and overcome the problem Jansky had. He could look somewhere and say, I know it's there, it's not there, it's here. And he mapped the sky, and then he submitted his papers to the Astrophysical Journal, which was edited at the time by Otto Struve. And all of Struve's editors told him, don't publish this radio from the sky. It's nonsense. He's obviously doing something wrong. But Struve decided it's better to publish something that turns out to be right than... Or, publish something that turns out to be wrong rather than not publish something that turns out to be right. So he published it, and it turned out to be right. Everybody won. So this is 1930s radio technology, and this is the current state of the art. This is the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia, which is called the Great Big Thing by the people who live around it. <laughs> It is 430 feet, 450 feet tall at the boom. Its collecting area is 2.3 acres, and it's 100 meters across, and it weighs 17 million pounds. And it's, um, wow, I'm running out of time already, and I barely started. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's big, and it's heavy. And let's go. And x-ray technology, you have to use grazing incidents for x-rays. Why do we look at stuff like this? Well, one thing is that the dust shines at you. This is Orion. If your eyes were sensitive to the infrared, you looked up at the sky, you'd see this. If they were not, you'd see this. And they're not, so you see this, not this. <coughs> and you can see through dust. This is the vis visible eyeball light. And when you get into long wavelengths, say 2 to a 1.65 microns, you can look right through the dust. Why do you want to look through the dust? Here's an entire cluster of stars hidden behind the dust. Visible light, nothing. Infrared, with the two-mass survey in the Wyoming Infrared Observatory, a whole globular cluster of stars is discovered hiding behind the dust. And now we can make whole galaxies disappear. This is M51 and its companion galaxy, invisible and infrared. Companion shows up nicely. Ultraviolet, no companion. How do you make a galaxy disappear? It's got old, low-mass stars and very few, if any, high-mass young stars, no star formation, so it generates almost no ultraviolet, hence it disappears. And here's a galaxy that I was told was an exploding galaxy when I was a kid, and then everybody decided galaxies don't blow up. Now we know that it is, in fact, blowing up. And here it is <laughs> blowing up. Uh, this is a Hubble Space Telescope image with stars. The white is the Chandra X-ray telescope image of million Kelvin gas, and the red is Spitzer Space Telescope image of warm dust, and zillions of supernova explosions are going off at once in this galaxy and blowing it to smithereens for good reasons, but since I'm running out of time, you can ask me later what those good reasons are, because I want to make an entire planet disappear, and here it is. 
uh, in met methane, uh, methane light 2.4 microns, the planet's atmosphere absorbs very nicely, so the planet disappears, but it didn't leave uh, without evidence. There's a shadow of the planet on the rings, which reflect very nicely. And here, of course, the rings disappear at five microns because they absorb, and then the planet is emitting thermal emission. Put them all together and you get this. <coughs> and this is what the sun looks like uh, in various wavelengths. And if you come back this evening for the panel discussion, I'm actually going to continue from here rather than repeat what I've done now and talk about the sun bringing about the end of the modern world as we know it. <coughs> uh, <laughs> so you want to you want to be there because I'm going to talk about the end. So uh, in visible light, the sun looks kind of like this. If you go out and look at the sun before it burns a hole through your retina and back of your head, so don't do it because you know, it's bad for you. You'd see something <laughs> boring like this. But if you switch to ultraviolet, uh, hydrogen alpha, or uh, extreme ultraviolet, you begin to see the high energy processes that go on up above the sun, uh, which could bring about the end of civilization as we know it. And of course, now I went too fast because I was running out of time, but that stuff are, are almost done. This is the cosmic microwave background. Again, it's invisible light, but this is an enormous tool for cosmologists to understand the universe. From this, you can figure out what banged, how it banged, when it banged, how the big bang banged, all kinds of good <laughs> stuff. And these differences in temperature, some low temperature and high temperature, tell you where superclusters <laughs> and clusters of galaxies ought to be. And in fact, people doing statistical correlations thank you, have demonstrated that there is a correlation between the distribution of mass in the universe and the distribution of temperature in the cosmic microwave background. Tells you how old the universe is, tells you where gravitational waves are, tells you all kinds of good stuff. And if you want to study cosmology, be my guest. I'm retired and you can't compete for my job anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and that's me in the thermal infrared. I use this picture because there's no gray in the hair in it anymore. <laughs> and, and I'm done, thank you. I've got, I've got a mic. Right, so you can go ahead and go on up and introduce yourself. Let me just. Uh, used to that. OK. Are we ready? All right. So. Um, Parisa introduced me. My name is Wayne Zimmerman. Um, I actually uh, am only semi-retired. Uh, the lab, uh, uh, JPL, has me on a list of people that they consider critical for certain areas. One of them is planetary robotics, which is something I've done for 30 years. And then, of course, the other is I also develop science instruments as well. So what I'm going to talk about today is basically how robotic space technology has evolved over the last 30 years. And I say it's a short span because actually when you see all, everything that we've done, you're going you're, you're gonna to basically look at this and say it's like a blink of an eye, and we'll talk about that. All right, so in the early years of planetary robotics, uh, the most significant Mars surface robotic uh, mission was the two Viking missions uh, in the late 70s. Um, and uh, one of the things that was really unique about that was um, the fact that they actually used a boob type deployable robotic arm. And, the, and, and of course, because they were looking for life, they didn't land in a place that was good for finding life because it was more like a desert. But, but the bottom line is they also did consider that they had to use a bio barrier. And what they used at that time is, is a solid shield over the lander. And, and one of the things that you have to remember is when they did these missions, um, these, these missions actually were fairly high mass. Um, and, um, and so basically, considering the hard shell that, that encompassed the lander, um, you know, and considering all of the science instruments that, that they were carrying, um, it, it, it really was a thing of beauty. It was a beautiful mission. Um, after Viking, unfortunately, uh, deep space orbiters were ushered in, and they kind of put surface missions on the back burners. And so 
But one thing that NASA did do was starting in the late 1970s and early 80s when I came to JPL, uh, NASA headquarters kicked off a fairly significant R&D effort in telerobotics and that most of this technology was to support space station. So the reason why I picked this topic as now and then um, is because of the fact that uh, a lot of cross-cutting technologies were spawned as a result of, of this investment. And this gets into robotic manipulators, rovers, advanced computing, control software, autonomy, AI, all kinds of new materials were developed. Uh, we looked at new types of actuation, all, times, all different types of uh, new sensors, uh, advanced power uh, systems, some of them uh, radioisotope systems like we have on Curiosity right now, huge advancements in solar cell technologies, batteries, fuel cells. I mean, it, it was just an incredible, an incredible period of time where we really, really invested in a lot of different technologies. So in the early 1980s, this is kind of what our laboratory experimental, experimental robotic platforms look like, and you're gonna have to excuse the quality of the images because I actually took, I took these images from old from old view graph presentations that we gave when we did our, our status reports for NASA headquarters. But we did some amazing things. We did, we did a lot of dual arm control uh, over here. Here, all, almost all of our tasks, again, were related to supporting space station. But here we are picking up a, um, uh, a large instrument using dual arm control. And, um, and understand that a lot of this, this is here we are capturing a spinning satellite. Uh, here we are again with um, doing another uh, uh, maintenance. Oh, here's the spinning satellite down here. And then of course we also made advancements in uh, operator control interfaces. Um, and, um, and the thing that's really amazing is that we were using at this time to do all of this controls and, and all of the um, um, uh, dual arm dual arm work that we did. And this was a combination, a hybrid control, where you're, where you're using some teleoperation, but you're also having autonomous control. All of this was done on a PCAT, if you can imagine that today. And, and, and this was state of the art at the time, and we were talking about memory on the order of 10 megabytes, which <laughs> probably, probably you could have 100 PCATs in your cell phone. Okay, so the evolution to actual Earth and planetary applications started in, uh, in the late 80s, 1998. And, um, and, and what happened was the robotics program branched out from robotic arm technology for space station to rovers. And there was a slow evolution towards better computational platforms and a big plus and breakthrough in terms of advanced sensing and control. <clears throat> so, and one of the things that helped us quite a bit was we did a lot of research in stereo image processing that allowed us to do target localization. So here's the Sojourner rover, um, and uh, we also did another rover um, called Marie Curie, which I used for uh, another mission that I worked on. This is the kind of uh, operator interface that we developed that was far advanced from anything we'd been doing before. Everything that we would do before, basically you'd just be looking at numbers joint and coordinates, joint angles and coordinates scrolling across a, stream, a screen, which makes it really hard to do any kind of control. So we incorporated the, the imaging and image processing. We also could look at stay out zones. We could uh, identify obstacles. And of course, this is the first major robotic arm that we built for uh, uh, Mars 98, which was the Mars Volatiles and Climate Surveyor. So, so basically now, we were starting to get back into business. Surface missions. So, a new era came into NASA. We had a new director, and he came from the private sector, and this was called the era of faster, better, cheaper. And this started in the mid to late 1990s, and, um, and while the manned space station uh, program grew, the planetary missions were under extreme pressure to go much smaller. So no more great observatories like the Galileos, the Cassinis, Spitzer was a large observatory. So the, the impact of this cost cutting with the missions and doing missions on two-year spots 
resulted in the Mars 98 lander and the DS2 probes that went with it. Basically, we crashed into the South Polar Cap. But, but the singular positive result that came out of that was that there was a huge push towards advanced ultra lightweight composites, miniaturization of instruments, more efficient power technology, and significant advancements in solid state device technology. Okay. All right. So we're back on track. Um, and, uh, and indeed, the result of the accident report that came out of it with a congressional review, it revealed that indeed NASA had cut the budget for planetary missions to a point where there was too much risk involved. So with, um, with the Mars 01 Odyssey mission, I, talked, I made reference to, uh, to the other rover that I actually uh, rebuilt for Mars 01, which also included a lander that had a robot arm. Um, what NASA decided to do was to keep the uh, orbiter, but take the rest of the money and put it into the development of the Mars Exploration Rovers. And of course, the subsequent budget was raised significantly to reduce risk. And so that resulted in our two MER rovers, one of which is still operating, okay? And of course, it also allowed us eventually to do the Phoenix lander in robotic arm. And we are able to use spare parts from, uh, from our Mars 01 mission, which also got the cost down. And in fact, this is the one mission where for the first time we actually found and sampled water for the first time on the Mars North Polar Cap. And, um, and this is, this is the, the MER robotic arm. Of course, here's one of the MER rovers. And this is an image taken from the lander, the Phoenix lander, of the North Polar Cap. Where we landed was at 74 degrees north latitude. The uh, polar cap actually extends down to about 80, 80 degrees north latitude. So we were just off the polar cap, but still close enough that in fact when we dug down 18 centimeters, we actually found ice for the first time. And we confirmed it not only with imaging, but also with the onboard mass spec. It was an incredible achievement. All right, so with that, we now had to move. NASA said, well, let's move towards longer life missions. And, uh, and of course, the uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter was actually able to see that we had seepage coming out of these steep cliffs on Mars. And it turns out that, um, that in fact, we also got later images in uh, May of uh, 2015 that had several seepages of briny water coming out. And so basically this really was a big push to do a longer life mission that would allow us to potentially find some place on Mars where we could have find life or, uh, or past life. But this was important because it caused an explosion of new technologies. We got now the, the use of a new multi-mission radioisotope generator, the MMRTG, um, and, uh, and, and we're talking basically allowing the rover to last for 20 years if, 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 it can, if the rest of the subsystems can survive. Um, we also um, um, developed a new propulsive landing system called the Sky Crane. Um, we've got advanced thermal control systems now with heat pipe technology. Uh, we've gone to a hybrid FPGA microprocessor technology that um, really move towards low volume packaging techniques, particularly for the electronics, and also this applied to the science instruments as well. We moved very aggressively towards miniaturization, um, advanced actuator technology. You know, one of the things that you, problems that you have when you use brushed actuators on Mars is the, the low humidity and, and the um, extremely thin environment causes arcing to occur, breaks down the brushes. So we made a big investment in brushless motors and now and also in terms of miniaturizing them. So bottom line is um, everything, everything that we did was just a huge, a huge move forward. Okay, so what's on the horizon? 
So when we look back over the last 30 years and consider the missions and accomplishments, I mean, literally, when you think about all the successes that NASA has had, I mean, it, it is literally the blink of an eye. And it's just amazing because I've been at the lab for 38 years now, and, and to me, I, I almost can't believe how fast the time has gone. And it just seems like we've moved from one mission to the next and everyone has gotten better and better and better. So where we are now is we're looking forward to Europa, Enceladus, and Titan. Uh, we currently have um, an orbiter around Jupiter right now, Juno, uh, that's exploring the atmosphere. And we're developing uh, the Clipper um, uh, spacecraft which is going to be, again, looking a lot harder at, uh, at um, Europa and doing a much, much uh, uh, better imaging so that we can actually find a landing place. You've probably seen on the news Enceladus is interesting because it has geysers. And so one of the things that we potentially want to do is either fly through those geysers or actually at some point land on Enceladus in, in the future. And then, of course, Titan. Titan is really exciting. I've worked, I've actually worked on, on, not so much on Enceladus, but on Europa and Titan, I've probably spent at least a decade developing technology for these kinds of missions. So again, we're going to be really pushing technologies in, in the area of electronics, uh, radiation uh, hard electronics, materials that can accommodate the extreme, red, we're talking 10 megarads of radiation on Europa, cryo temperatures 90 to 100 Kelvin, and we also want to look at the ability to potentially probe below the ice with miniature instruments capable of finding life. So one of the questions that we're asking ourselves now is given that, that, that a lot of this is within reach, is will the next 50 years allow us to find signatures of life somewhere within our solar system? So I included an image here. This is uh, uh, the surface of Europa. Um, actually, I'm working on Europa again right now. And uh, we're working on landing sites where we could potentially be fairly stable. Uh, the crustal dynamics on Europa, due to the gravitational uh, pull of, uh, and, and tidal forces from Jupiter, is substantial. It's, it's 30 meters every, every three days. So it's, it's, it's pretty, which is why everything is so highly fractured. And then, of course, this is the Huygens image as it was landing. This is the surface of Titan. Uh, what they found is that when the lander actually hit, uh, the accelerometers showed that it, it wasn't an uh, icy surface as much as it was kind of a, a, slice, a slushy surface. So there was a little bit of a crust, and then it broke through. Uh, and then, of course, here's, here's one of the lakes on Titan that, uh, that we would also like to explore. All right, so one final note. NASA and JPL, and it isn't just JPL, but the other NASA centers too, uh, work very closely with industry and universities in the development of advanced technologies, um, particularly for planetary robotic systems. And this is in structural materials, electronics, power and thermal systems, sensing and optics. Uh, and, and a lot of that is done through direct NASA R&D funding. Um, some of it is done through small business, small business innovative research um, uh, proposals. And then also we sometimes also do sole source contracts if we find someone that has a very unique capability. So the private se the thing that's nice here with the private sector is that we're not like the Department of Defense. With the Department of Defense, when you develop technology, by definition, you have to wait 10 years, and then it's considered obsolete. But for NASA, because we're all funded by your taxpayers' dollars, in fact, um, when we work with industry, uh, they, they get to keep that technology for their own product line. So, for example, uh, we work with Xilinx. Xilinx has uh, developed a um, reprogrammable FPGA. FPGAs are really nice to have because they're almost like a prom. You, you burn in the software, and they're a lot, lot less susceptible to single event upset. But once that software is burned in, you can't change it. Okay. So, so Xilinx came and talked to us and said, well, you know, we'd like to space qualify our FPGA, but we don't know how. Well, we have a micro devices lab uh, in my division, in the instruments division, that actually, well, we can test it for them. So we work with them. 
Uh, we've worked with uh, another company called Temic. It's, it's a French company that uh, develops uh, rad hard uh, electronics for the nuclear uh, power industry. And, uh, and again, they've come to us and said, you know, we, we would really like to be able to provide this technology also for space. And so we've, we actually spent time with them several years ago and helped them determine how to test their technology and how to make it even more rad hard. Um, my instrument is Chemin, which is on the Curiosity rover right now. It stands for Chemistry and Mineralogy. And, uh, and it's an X-ray diffraction instrument. Very quickly, basically, you have an X-ray beam. And uh, you drop a sample into a sample cell that has two windows. So the sample is a granular sample that's sandwiched between the two windows. You send an X-ray beam through that as you excite the sample. And the X-ray beam is diffracted and deflected, and it forms a pattern as it impacts each of the crystal surfaces. And that pattern forms a semicircular pattern. It's called a Bragg pattern. And in fact, it is unique for every single mineral. So the bottom line is we were working with a private, uh, a small private vendor that does a really, really good job with x-ray sources. So we brought them on board to work with us for the flight project. And the problem is, is they'd never done any flight hardware, OK? So they were struggling and struggling and struggling, and they weren't making it, and they were over budget, and they were over schedule. So what we ended up doing was number one, they had quality assurance problems. We sent our quality assurance pay people to their facility and had them work with them to help them improve their quality assurance processes. We brought in the electronics, and we brought in the, uh, the rest of the system, like the optics, and we did it for them. And then they basically ended up with a better product. So this is a nice example of how NASA and, uh, and, the, and uh, the national laboratories work with the private sector in a way to really develop technology. And that's it. <laughs> you gave yours away? <laughs> they were asking how the world is going to end. Because of you. <laughs> uh, two questions, I guess. Um, it seems awful coincidental that you and I see <coughs> specifically in, in the visible wavelength. How did it come to be that? Okay, the question was, how do we see what comes through the atmosphere? Is it serendipitous that our eye just happens to work where the atmosphere is transparent? My guess is it's not serendipitous, it's evolution. Uh, the things that could see a little better are the things that grew the eyes, and so naturally your eyes would, uh, would work where the atmosphere is transparent, it seems an evolutionary biologist can probably give you a better answer than I could as to exactly how that comes about. But gases like the Earth's atmosphere are generally pretty transparent at those wavelengths anyway. And it also works out physically because of the size of your pupil that uh, light doesn't diffract remarkably. If you had a smaller pupil, you'd have a harder time seeing with diffraction patterns superimposed. <coughs> and of course, the longer the wavelength, the bigger the opening you have to have. So if you wanted to see in radio, you'd have to have eyes like this, and that would be kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> Next question is for Wayne. Um, if future missions visit Europa or Titan or Enceladus and have the capability of discovering life forms, whether bacterial simple as it might be or, or complex, what is the procedure for NASA to inform the public and can you explain how would that go? It's a complex process. Um, it, it starts with first understanding whether or not the signature that we're getting back is indeed 
a true signature of either past or extant life, okay? And, and the reason why that's important is because um, one of the things that you have to be very careful about when you're actually looking for organics or signs of life is whether or not you're contaminating the surface, okay? So if, for example, on my Phoenix uh, arm, we had a bio barrier that protected the arm. Well, once we deployed it, if for some reason somebody cut their fingernails that day and, and happened to leave part of it, you know, in the scoop, and we drop that on the surface, and then we scoop that sample, and we put it in a mass spec, and we find that, ah, we discovered life, okay? <laughs> it would be a false positive, all right? So that's the first step, is to make sure that whatever it is that you're seeing is, in fact, what you think you're, you're, you're seeing. Um, and, uh, and then the, the next part of that process is analyzing that data very, very carefully. Because we've had an incident where uh, one of the biologists at one of the elder NASA centers went to um, an area where um, they, they thought that they found um, a previously unknown microorganism and wrote a paper about it and everything. And it turned out that, um, that they did their chemistry wrong, okay? And in fact, it wasn't that at all. Uh, and, it, and it was a huge backlash. So, so before any information would be let out to the public or anything like that, there would be a huge you know, effort put into analyzing that data in great detail before anything would be done. So NASA is very, very careful about releasing information to the public. Ah, that was uh, very interesting. Um, the, um, the lander, because it's so light weight, okay, um, the legs on the lander are flex, flexible, okay. And, um, and the way that they programmed the computer for the lander to let it, to, let, to shut off the, the, the uh, uh, propulsion system when they touched the ground, was accelerometers on the legs that would actually sense the flex and then they would shut off the engines, okay? So, but because of cost constraints, they never did a complete system test. And so when we actually got to Mars and the lander was approaching the surface, what happened was after the chute was deployed, okay, and then, and then the chute was um, jettisoned, the propulsion system fired and the legs flecked, flexed. And the computer got a false positive that we were on the surface, shut off the engines, and we fell about 100 meters to the surface. I was, uh, I was with the newscasters um, that night, and, um, and a uh, uh, journalist with Fox News interviewed me. And right away, as soon as we got word back that we weren't getting any more signals, we figured out that we had crashed, okay, because we couldn't communicate anymore. And right away, you know, she was asking me, you know, okay, so what, what happened, what happened, what happened, you know? And of course, we hadn't had a chance to actually do the analysis. And the best I could tell her was, um, uh, I'm sorry, but we don't know yet. And, um, and this is three o'clock in the morning. We've all been up all night long, you know, because we're doing the mission control part. And we're all tired. And she lost, I think she was just tired. And she, she told the camera guy to turn the camera off and she's yelling at me, right? What is it with you scientists? You know, how is it that you know what's going on? You know, what are you holding back from the public and all this stuff? And, <laughs> and, uh, and I felt so bad. You know, I, all I could say was, I, look, I'm really sorry, but you know, we haven't gotten enough information back yet to be able to determine what really happened and, and why we're not getting a signal. But it was, um, that was pretty stressful. You know, when you have newscasters wanting information, <laughs> and they want it now, it's, uh, it's, it's a very difficult situation to be in.
we had a we had a much better much better time with curiosity. Was that the time? <laughs> Barbecue pit, huh? <laughs> um, all, of course, all data comes with natural variations in it. They're just they're, they're dependent on the temperature of your instrument, what's moving, what isn't moving. It's just natural noise. And so their observations were, uh, had too much um, natural variation compared to the magnitude of the number. And so they couldn't easily say, we've definitely seen this because there's too much noise on top of it. Modern instruments have a lot less noise and therefore are able to give you more certain measurements. And the guy with the sign in the back says, we have one minute left. About, about, okay, uh, the question is, what about, what, what is the comment on Obama's, Obama's recent statement that he wants to put people on Mars? Um, actually, uh, the previous Bush administration um, came out uh, and said that they wanted to put people on Mars. And Dick Cheney actually came out to JPL to, uh, to talk to people. Unfortunately, um, he came to the wrong center because, because we, we don't do manned space. We, we do planetary science, okay? But um, it turned out that um, uh, Bush had actually uh, appointed uh, a private sector individual to run NASA, and in fact, uh, he completely torqued NASA's budget around to support the manned space program. So about that time, the planetary space program really suffered, okay? Unfortunately, it was, it was basically done as a um, re-election promo but na because NASA's budget never changed. And in fact, it went down a little bit. And, uh, and so all that they could do was just start working on some of the advanced propulsion systems. Um, since that time, uh, the new NASA administrator actually has made a push to work with the private sector to develop bigger propulsion systems that would allow us to really launch heavier cargoes, i.e. people, right? Um, and of course, we have organizations like SpaceX coming up, uh, Orion, you know, has their hat hmm. in the game. Um, and... Um, I think you're out of time. Say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So let me just finish, so, but, but in, in fact, uh, it, it looks like there is going to be a push, but it's, it's going to be way, way, way off, way off. It's a very complex problem. If you, if you could estimate a year when people walk on Mars, when would that be? Okay, I'm not a manned space person, but just from understanding the technology and having worked on space stations uh, and being an astronaut candidate at one point, um, I would say the best soonest would be maybe 2050 or 2060.